So good afternoon and welcome to this uh, 2020 EPCR session. That is an uh, Abbott sponsored session about the Tendine TMBI device. Um, I have the pleasure to work throughout this session with my two colleagues, Dr. Um, Alison Duncan, who is cardiologist and uh, imaging specialist from London, and uh, Dr. Leonard Conradi, who is cardiac surgeon from Hamburg, but uh, also really uh, focused uh, to peculiar treatment of uh, structural heart disease. So before to start, I just want to mention to all the people connected uh, uh, to this session that you can, uh, uh, and you're strongly invited to share your comments or questions uh, with a virtual forum chat tool that uh, is available uh, in order to make this session live. So as mentioned, uh, initially this session is dedicated to a tendine TMVI therapy. And uh, more precisely, the objectives uh, we'll cover throughout this, uh, this session will be to offer an overview of a Tendine device uh, throughout clinical experience already uh, published or communicated and indications, uh, to discuss the imaging screening process that is crucial to identify patients likely to benefit from this new therapy, and Finally, to review case examples from uh, uh, Leonard Conradi's first commercial experience and, uh, and share with him uh, his experience. So the first presentation of this session is uh, uh, about an overview of the uh, Tendine uh, uh, TMVI therapy and clinical experience uh, uh, currently available. So for, this is my disclosures, for those of you who might not be uh, familiar yet with the Tendine TMVI, here on your screen, a short animation showing that this valve is introduced through a trans surgical transapical access as a unique encoded uh, valve design, and we'll discuss that later on, is fully retrievable throughout the procedure and doesn't need any cardiopulmonary bypass, of course, or rapid ventricular pacing to be delivered. To have a more precise overview of a device, you have here a, a more detailed view of the valve. Uh, it's a tree leaflet by a prosthetic valve that has an outer frame controlled to mitral annulus with multiple valve size and profiles to uh, adapt to each uh, particular patient's anatomies. As you saw and uh, as you understood, it is anchored with a tether that separates uh, the ceiling from the circumment and that enables through, uh, throughout the initial procedure uh, to, be, to retrieve the device if necessary. And finally, uh, the tether is secured at the apex of a left ventricle with an apical pad uh, who might be useful for hemostasis during the procedure. So now let's uh, briefly uh, cover the clinical experience already uh, available so far with a Tendine device. Um, the one, initial 100 patients that were uh, treated uh, in uh, initial feasibility study with a one-year follow-up uh, have been published uh, one year ago by Paul Sarajas, first order in Jack. And uh, during this uh, year uh, EPCR session, the two year outcomes uh, were, were presented by David Mueller. Briefly to come back on those data, uh, to have in mind the, the, the characteristics of those patients, those population in this study, uh, patients included in this study were 75 years old, uh, all highly symptomatic, mostly class three, four and IWHA, uh, high risk surgical patient, mostly um, more, uh, almost 90% uh, suffering from severe secondary MR, and as mentioned, high, high surgical risk reflected by a, a mean STS score uh, that is almost 8%. I think what is really striking and noticeable with this device, and we have all uh, noticed that in our uh, local experience, is the safety of the procedure. And you see that for uh, this initial uh, experience, the implant success was 97% uh, with no procedural mortality, no procedural stroke, no emergent convention to open out surgery. Um, the 30 day and one year outcomes that were uh, afterwards published gave some safety outcomes that are totally acceptable considering this high risk population with a 6% 30 day mortality. 26% uh, one-year mortality, quite low rate of stroke, disability stroke, and no need for intervention 
in a vast proportion of the patients. At two years, uh, the all-cause death is uh, 39%, mainly explained by cardiovascular mortality, caused mainly by heart failure. And uh, remember, remember, remind that, uh, remember that we treated in this uh, study a severe uh, a functional MR, mainly with poor LV function. And as a consequence, of course, of those poor LV function, the second driver of late mortality was arrhythmia or cardiac arrest in this population. But what is really important and noticeable is uh, the uh, effects, the uh, efficacy of this device to re reduce the mitral regurgitation, as you see here on this graph, with a sustained effect uh, that is uh, at two years almost comparable at, as a, a discharge or, or at one month's follow-up or a one-year follow-up with almost all of the patients uh, having, having no more than one plus a residual MR uh, during follow-up. As a consequence of this uh, sustained and efficient re reduction of the MR, uh, the quality of life and the functional improvement of the patients is, uh, is uh, significantly uh, uh, improved here from the baseline as reflected by the NIOH score and the uh, overall questionnaire of quality of life. So in summary, we have evidence with those data that Tendine TMBR uh, eff effectively reduces the MR uh, and it's sustained up to two years of follow-up uh, with an improvement of quality of life of the patients uh, related to this, uh, to this improvement. But uh, I think it's always maybe better to illustrate that with the case example. And here, a case example of a patient we treated two years ago with severe ischemic functional MR with an immediate outcome that is the one we almost already have with this device, that is no uh, or trace of residual MR. And with this two year follow up, uh, we've still a, a perfect function of a valve uh, during this follow up with a three millimeter of mercury gradient. Another subset of patient that was studied and where uh, the Tendine device is really, really uh, uh, useful and may improve uh, the pronostic and the quality of life of the patient is the MAC. So we know from previous experience with other device that the percutaneous treatment of MAC, uh, uh, namely with a balloon expandable uh, Edwards valve, is related to quite some uh, uh, important adverse events. It was to this with a Tendine device with quite a high risk population, as you see here illustrated by this, uh, by this uh, graph. And Again, uh, despite this high risk population, with a, a remarkable uh, safety profile of a procedure, 100% of technical success, no adverse events uh, noticed during the procedure, and at the six months outcome, of course, uh, a mortality that is totally understandable uh, considering the level of risk of this population, but no, uh, truly speaking, no a real uh, serious adverse event related to the procedure or to the failure of the procedure and at the follow-up uh, sustained and eff efficient uh, reduction of uh, MR uh, with no PVD. So in summary, we see that uh, Tendine use in the specific context of MAC is safe, uh, uh, reduces the MR uh, in the same uh, proportion and with the same beautiful outcomes that the one we see uh, in non-MAC patient and could offer a, a, a potential therapy that uh, could be promising if we compare that to the historical data we have with other devices. Again, a, a small case example uh, illustrating that, uh, the echo before uh, implantation and after implantation showing uh, uh, um, perfect uh, procedural outcome and reduction of the uh, of EMRs. And what is nice with this device is that uh, it can treat uh, a wide range of uh, anatomies. So both uh, patients suffering from primary MR, of course, considered at a prohibitive risk by the heart team and with some uh, uh, morphological uh, details that will be uh, discussed afterwards, or secondary MR, of course, if patients are optimally treated uh, uh, um, with uh, uh, CRT if necessary. So I think to conclude, maybe uh, we can try to define the optimal uh, Tendine patient profile that is kind of summarized in this table. So let's say it's a patient having a severe MR with a quantitative uh, um, uh, 
assessments that is notified here in the slides, uh, we have, we, which has a um, uh, dimension of a left ventricle that has been defined by some work done by Leonard uh, in order to avoid LDOT obstruction, but is of course able to tolerate uh, a surgical transtapical access. And we don't have to make selection mistakes about that. And who has a wide or complex jet morphology or, or multiple jets or previous TMVR procedure with no devices implanted. More detailed, if the patient has a primary MR, let's say that it should not be suitable for a transcatheter mitral valve repair uh, by the heart team. Uh, for example, patients having calcification, tissue loss, or perforation in the grasping area for edge-to-edge uh, -edge mitral valve repair. And if patient is suffering from secondary MR, is a patient with moderate to severe left leg tethering, as the one I showed in, in an example, with a left ventricle eject, ejection fraction that is not too depressed uh, in order to benefit from the therapy afterwards and not to suffer from a severe heart failure symptoms despite correction of the mitral regurgitation. And uh, we are now going to listen to uh, Alison Duncan, uh, who is going to present data about uh, uh, patient selection and more precisely echo uh, screening of uh, patient can uh, candidates for TMBI. Thanks, Alison. So thank you so much, Nicola, and to EuroPCR and to Abbott for asking me to speak to you today on the patient selection, clinical and echo criteria for this new TMVI therapy, the Tendine device to eliminate mitral regurgitation. And these are my conflicts of interest. And so just to expand further on what Nicola was saying about inclusion criteria for this device, the Tendine device, um, it is an extraordinarily versatile device to use for patients with mitral regurgitation insofar as it can be used to treat severe mitral regurgitation with an etiology either of degenerative mitral regurgitation or functional mitral regurgitation according to the mitral valve MVAR criteria. Really, in terms of the patient inclusion criteria, is the patients need to have severe mitral regurgitation and be symptomatic while on guideline-directed medical therapy, including CRT, if that's indicated. And the only other real inclusion criteria is that, that the heart team, as we've presented today, as a group needs to decide that the patient is not suitable candidate for surgical therapy according to valid surgical guidelines. So all patients being considered for Tendine TMVI require a tra baseline transthoracic echo, a transesophageal echo and a CT scan that Dr. Conradi will go through with you after my talk. And the baseline transthoracic echo is very important for assessing LV cavity size, overall left ventricular ejection fraction, to quantify the severity of the uh, mitral regurgitation using the standard PISA method and for quantifying the severity of pulmonary hypertension. But really the mainstay of uh, echo screening for tendine is to is via the transesophageal echo, which is what I'm going to take you through now. So the baseline TOE on a patient that's passed the screen passed for the tendine implantation would be a patient such as this. So the LV is uh, moderately dilated, the ejection fraction is probably somewhere between 35 and 40 percent, and the mitral valve is significantly tethered with restriction of the posterior leaflet and indeed for this matter the anterior leaflet throughout the whole of the coaptation line. And this is confirmed with the Swede on FAS, where you can see again there's posterior leaflet restriction and there's some anterior leaflet restriction and also the images are very helpful to be able to say that you've got good images so that you can see the procedure implantation at the time of the device implantation. So the extra thing that you can do is to look at the severity of the mitral regurgitation and the extent and in this view you can see that it runs really all the way along the coaptation line running from this, the medial aspect of the valve all the way through the centre of the valve into the lateral aspect of the valve. So this is very significant functional mitral regurgitation. The first thing to do on screening is to uh, measure the mitral valve annular size and this is easily done on a 2D image as an X-plane um, 
uh, freezed frame at end systole, and we can see here that the intercommercial dimension is 36 millimeters and the AP dimension is three centimeters. The AP dimension is also called the septal lateral dimension. And this is um, really quite beautifully done on X-plane 2D imaging, but more sophisticatedly, it can be reconstructed on a 3D analysis where we can measure the AP dimension, the intercommercial dimension, as well as the perimeter area and tenting height, saddle height of the mitral valve annulus. So lots of information can be obtained from the 3D analysis. But essentially what we really need to know is the AP dimension and the, C, the intercommercial dimension because the device comes in uh, standard sizes that can be tailored for an individual to a point, but really the lower limit for an AP dimension is 29 and the upper limit is 41 millimetres. And similarly for the intercommercial dimension, currently the devices come minimal size of 34 millimetres up to a maximal size of 50 millimetres. The next thing to exclude is the length of the anterior mitral valve leaflet in order to be able to assess the patient of risk of left ventricular outflow tract obstruction and SAM. And this can easily be done on a still frame uh, 2D image of the anterior mitral valve, but equally can be done more, performed more sophisticatedly with 3D analysis where the lengths of the uh, A1 scallop, A2 scallop and A3 scallop could be measured just to give you some more information. Uh, However, it's, what's, what's beautiful about TOE is we don't get a static view of the anterior mitral valve leaflet. And here are two cases where the anterior mitral valve leaflet probably measures a fairly similar uh, length in terms of 2D assessment. But you can see the image on the left, the anterior mitral valve leaflet is fairly tethered and is pulled posterior laterally way, way away from the um, left ventricular outflow tract. Whereas the image on the right, the, the anterior mitral valve leaflet is less well supported. It's very much more mobile and possibly has an increased risk of developing uh, or, or causing systolic anterior motion once a TMVI device is implanted. So it's useful to have a mobile uh, uh, dynamic image of the mitral valve to assess your risk of SAM. The next thing is to make a 2D assessment of the LV outflow tract dimension, which could easily be done on 2D, but this is a really nice way of looking at the left ventricular outflow. If you look at the top left hand screen, you can imagine that we're sitting in the left ventricle looking up towards the aortic valve, and we can see a nice wide open left ventricular outflow with a tethered anterior mitral valve leaf not encroaching into the left ventricular outflow. And indeed, we can make a still frame measurement of um, the left ventricular outflow in terms of orthogonal measurement and an area. And just for comparison, I put at the bottom here a patient with a very hyperdynamic basal septum and a slightly less supported anterior mitral valve leaflet. And you can see how the left ventricular outflow tract closes much more significantly in the bottom right hand image compared to the top right hand image. The next thing we need to assess for uh, potential for left ventricular outflow tract obstruction is the aortomitral angle. And really what we want is a nice wide open aortomitral angle with a, really the lower limit of normal being 120 uh, degrees. And this is very rapidly and easily done with 3D assessment of the mitral valve. So special considerations are given to patients with um, left ventricular dimensions more than seven and ejection fractions hovering around about 30% because after all, this is the real world. These two types of patients would be excluded from the early feasibility study. But as we will see later on, we have performed tendine TMVI successfully in such patients on a compassionate use basis. It Patients with severe tricuspid regurgitation, as seen on the top right here, or patients with severe right ventricular dilatation or significant pulmonary hypertension would traditionally be excluded from the early feasibility clinical type screening process for patients with tendine. And yet we've been able to have fairly successful outcomes in patients with these uh, exclusion criteria when, when tendine TMVI was performed as a um, Nicola mentioned earlier on the importance of assessing the right ventricular function, and this can be done of, obviously on 2D assessment with M mode, tissue Doppler and strain rate. And really at the moment, patients with severe right ventricular dysfunction are excluded or have been excluded from the early feasibility trials. And, and it is not clear yet, we don't know enough yet about how patients 
right ventricular function will respond once the load is removed on the left hand side when the MR is removed. I won't dwell too long on this, but traditionally the patients with a uh, aortic valve replacements or uh, TAVI devices had been excluded from the early feasibility studies. And you can see here, this patients had an Edwards uh, Sapien TAVI device placed in and subsequently had a very successful implantation of a Tendine device as a proof of concept. And equally not to dwell on it, but uh, patients with mitral annular calcification are a, a separate subset excluded from the early feasibility clinical trial, but clearly uh, some really fantastic results in a very small number of patients so far with a Tendine IMMAC type procedure. So just, I think sometimes it's quite helpful to look at patients that are anatomically unsuitable. That really helps you to, to when you've seen the people that are suitable, and then you see the people that are potentially unsuitable for TMVI currently. And in this particular patient already, we can see that this patient would have screen failed because the annulus is very small, intercommissural dimensions only 31. In this particular patient, this patient screen failed as the annulus was too large, and currently we do not have a device to fit an AP dimension of 53 millimetres and an intercommissural dimension of 61 millimetres. In this particular patient, not only did the patient have a very small annulus, but also you can see the LVOT is fairly small, even just qualitatively. The patient's also got a very narrow aortic mitral angle, and this patient would be at risk of LVOT obstruction should a transcatheter mitral valve device be implanted into their mitral valve annulus. And just to confirm, this patient's mitral, uh, aortic mitral angle was only about 97 degrees, so certainly um, very, 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 very acute angle across the aortic mitral junction. In this patient, they've got a combination of all three, so um, uh, very, very narrow aortic mitral angle, very small left ventricular outflow tract, a slightly long, slightly unsupported anterior mitral valve leaflet, so again, would have screen failed due to uh, potential neo-LVOT uh, obstruction. So we've been through a lot of the, uh, the echocardiographic criteria for tendine TMVI, and of course there will be other factors determining whether patients are good candidate and some of these are clinical and some of these are uh, uh, imaging screening. Clearly if a patient has got a severely frail poor nutritional status and a, a very hostile chest they may not be suitable for a trans apical uh, implantation. We talked a lot about whether the ejection fraction was uh, above 30% or not. If it's hovering around about 30%, it can sometimes be helpful, particularly if there's no other options for the patient to assess whether the patient has some contractile reserve or uh, possibly fibrosis on the uh, cardiac MRI. And this is where a functional test, particularly um, a stress echo might be useful, not only to exclude potential myocardial ischemia, but to assess whether the patient has contractile reserve. And for that matter, it's often quite useful to perform a heart catheter to see if the patient has got any reversibility, particularly if they've got pulmonary hypertension. Um, other factors just to put into the mix is to see whether the patient's had prior cardiac surgery, which might put your potential conventional mitral valve um, surgery, looking at the patient's respiratory renal function and peripheral vascular disease. So I just wanted to, in the last few minutes of my talk, to go through the case presentation of the first patient that we did at the Brompton Hospital, which indeed was the first patient in the world. This was a 68-year-old lady with previous coronary artery bypass graft and patent grafts on a recent coronary angiogram. This lady had fairly brittle heart failure with two admissions with heart failure in the prior six months, and indeed at assessment was in MHA class four. Um, of note, she had mild renal impairment with a GFR 47, some impaired transfer factor on respiratory function tests, and her overall risk factor scores were elevated at STS score was 17 and her Euro score was 30. She had severe functional mitral regurgitation and of note, her pulmonary pressures were extraordinarily elevated at 107. So this lady would have conventionally been excluded through the early feasibility study, but managed to have a tendine implant through a compassionate use uh, trial. This is her baseline uh, 
imaging and you can see again very familiar now slightly dilated impaired left ventricle with severe functional mitral regurgitation due to tensing of the anterior and posterior mitral valve leaflet. The tendine device was implanted beautifully with no paravalvular leak, no systolic anterior motion, no left ventricular outflow tract and a well seated tendine device on uh, 3D imaging and on fluoroscopy. Five years after her compassionate use tendine, the device was very stable, very durable, there was no evidence of device migration, no transvalvular MR or paravalvular leak, and importantly, no left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. And this, this slide shows the first two patients, but the lady we're talking about is the bar, are the bar charts in red, and you can see that although, although her ejection fraction remained pretty stable over the, the five years follow-up, her stroke forward, her, sorry, her forward stroke volume increased significantly going along with a very improved symptomatic status, increased exercise tolerance, and importantly, a dramatic fall in her pulmonary arterial uh, systolic pressure from over 100 to about 40 uh, millimeters of mercury. So although she wouldn't have met conventional criteria, this lady has performed extraordinarily well on compassionate use uh, criteria for her tendine implantation. So thank you very much and thank you for allowing me to present the ECHO findings for Tendine. Thank you very much, Alison, for uh, this uh, beautiful and comprehensive overview of all the clinical and uh, echographic parameters that are necessary to assess uh, before to implant a tendon, uh, Tendine device. The other part of the selection process is to analyze the cardiac CT and uh, Leonard is going now to present on that because he, it's a topic that he has, uh, he has studied and uh, he, he has to describe this, uh, his findings mother. So thank you, Nicolas, for the nice introduction. Uh, and thanks to your PCR as well as Abbott to invite me to be part of this uh, e-session. Uh, my task will be to explain to you why CT screening is important for Tendine, a little bit in analogy to what Alison has done for ECHO, I guess. These are my disclosures. So obviously the patient anatomy, and I think we've learned that very nicely from Alison already, significantly affects the suitability of TMVI. And um, uh, you may be aware that uh, there's a, depending on the device you're using, there may be quite a large uh, screen fail rate of patients due to anatomical factors. And um, to determine which patients actually qualify for a TMVI, usually CT is uh, the key of um, imaging uh, modality. It needs to be a full cardiac cycle, uh, contrast enhanced CT naturally, because it has to uh, respect the fact that the mitral annulus and the surrounding anatomies are highly variable across the cardiac cycle. And um, the simulation of the neo-LVOT uh, needs post-processing of that CT with secondary softwares in, and sometimes uh, integration of computerized models of the respective prosthesis you're uh, planning to implant. And this can be quite a time consuming uh, process. So before uh, I'll go into detail of the study that I wanted to present to you, I'm going to walk you into the, in the first part of this presentation through what is a regular workup for a patient uh, who is being scheduled or planned for uh, TMBI using Tendine. First of all, and this is maybe with some respect similar to what some of you may be familiar with from TAVI, uh, the, the annular segmentation. We need uh, the exact anatomical uh, dimensions of the mitral annulus. As I said before, we need measurements in systole and diastole due to the variability across the cardiac cycle. One other very important thing is uh, to assess the neo LVOT. Alison has just shown you beautifully with echo examples how patients, uh, how different factors from echo, but as well as from CT, can affect suitability, yes or no, with regard to the neo LVT, because naturally uh, the implant that um, the tendine represents is a large one and it will need to respect the surrounding anatomies, especially the neo-LVOT, because naturally when implanting this device, we are uh, pushing the anterior leaflet towards the left ventricular outflow tract. So this is one extremely important aspect. Again, these measurements have to be done in diastole and systole. Uh, the exact cutoff of a sufficient neo-LVT is something that is still, I guess, a matter of debate. 
some investigators believe a cutoff value of 200 square millimeters may be sufficient. Then there is, of course, a discussion on when to measure that neo LVOT dimension. Should it be in systole? Should it be in diastole? That is something that we could discuss if we find the time. AML length measurements, something that can be done by ECHO beautifully, as Alison has showed you, but uh, of course it is repeated by CT and today's resolution of the modern CT scanners give enough information to be able to do this. And then since uh, at present this is a transapical uh, device, uh, the, the access in the th uh, on the thorax is something that you should do again. If you remember the times when we were still doing transapical TAVR, this was not uh, too different. We are trying to um, keep the incision small. We're trying to do this as a non-rip spreading, minimal trauma kind of access in these more often than not frail patients. So an exact determination of the thoracic access is something that can be beautifully done by CT. And the same is true for the apical access. Remember that the fixation, as Nicholas has explained in the beginning, is a focal one. This is a device that is fixed in position focally on the epimyocardial Near apex, near apex surface. Um, so the trajectory of the tether from uh, the, the stent outflow to the apex is very important in order not to bias the valve stent uh, to uh, uh, an undesired uh, angle. And finally, of course, at, with every, as with every transapical uh, procedure, you will need to respect uh, the structures of the left ventricular cavity ex itself, especially the subvalvular apparatus, including corda uh, as well as papillary muscles, which have to be uh, steered free of. The working angle of the sheath uh, in a transverse as well as an off table um, measure is also important in order to be as perpendicular as possible when inserting the sheath and directing it towards the mitral annulus. Sheath rotation, of course, is something that we can also predict by CT. And finally, the assessment of the atrial dimension, um, the guide wire and then part of the sheath, and especially some of the uh, stent parts are going to sit in the atrium and um, uh, a, a decent left atrial dimension is a prerequisite, of course, in patients with severe, sometimes long-standing mitral regurgitation do provide um, or, or do present with, with uh, sufficient LA dimensions. This is something that we also measure by CT. The working angulation, or let's say the fluoroscopic C-arm angulation is determined as well. More Sometimes uh, these are angles are not very practical. As you can see in this example, an REO, steep REO of 45 may be very difficult uh, to achieve or if achievable, uh, will um, give problems to the, to the apical implanter. So we always calculate something of a, let's say an alternative angulation, which can also uh, work well for your implantation. So I, I think after this first part of the procedure here, uh, pr presentation, it's, it, is, it has become clear that this is, um, it can be quite time consuming. This is very elaborate kind of screening. And of course, we do not want to subject patients that would disqualify beforehand to this kind of um, um, yeah, time-consuming uh, segmentation and analysis. So it's, it, I think it would be highly desirable if we could have a simple measure that could predict whether a patient would qualify or not before going through all this work. And this is exactly what we've been trying to do. And I will uh, show you uh, with towards the second half of my uh, presentation uh, how we, we are trying, and I think we've achieved to at least to some extent, uh, and a predictive value of a simple but standardized CT-derived anatomic measure and its ability to discriminate patients who would screen pass versus those which have an anatomy which would uh, make them a screen failure. So as, as to the methods, uh, we were able to include close to 500 patients that had been evaluated within the Tendine Expanded Clinical Study within the given time frame. Um, since we were uh, aiming at anatomical eligibility or morphological eligibility, we excluded all those patients that were deemed ineligible within the study for non-anatomic uh, issues. So for clinical or study criteria, such as 
for example, a patient with excessive pulmonary hypertension, a severely heart failure with LVEF below 30%. So everything that would make them an ex exclusion apart from anatomy. And in the second step, and I will show you a, a, a flow chart later on, all those subjects, all those patients that had any of the dimensions above or below what had been stated as the maximum or minimum uh, ranges in the IFU were also excluded. And then for the remainder of patients, we were we calculated uh, receiver operator characteristic, characteristic curves for nine uh, measures or nine anatomic measurements, which are routinely assessed to um, correctly classify patients for their suitability. This is the flow chart. So from top to bottom, we started out with 496 patients of whom 110 uh, screen failed within the trial for clinical factors that are not anatomy related, uh, leaving us with 386 patients that met both study criteria and were also clinically suitable. Uh, furthermore, in the second step, we excluded another 129 patients, which had either too large or too small annular dimensions for the available uh, range of devices. And this left us with the core uh, trial population of 257 patients that were within the annular dimensions, uh, according to IFU. From those, um, 59, close to 60%, 153 individuals were actually implanted with the tendon device, whereas 104 had to be excluded uh, for anatomical concerns. These are the nine um, CT parameters that we analyzed uh, with the receiver operator characteristics analysis. And uh, it's, very, it's easy to see that the left ventricular and systolic dimension with a sample size of 250 uh, gave us an area under the curve of 0.908 um, and was therefore uh, chosen as the best, let's say surrogate parameter to determine CT-based anatomical eligibility. And this is the same uh, analysis in a graphic view to the left. Uh, and to the right, you can see that we chose of, uh, LVESD cutoffs of five millimeters, starting at patients that were above or equal to 30 millimeters and ending in patients that had LVESD diameters of above or equal to 50 millimeters. And further to the right in the table, second last column, you can see that the positive predictive value almost has a linear uh, function from 63% uh, positive prediction up to above 92% positive prediction. So um, this seemed to be, um, in this early analysis, a useful tool to determine eligibility. Furthermore, what we did is uh, to take these cutoff values in five millimeter increments regarding the to the LVESD. You can see in the middle column the subjects that fulfilled or that were within these strata. And then to the very right, we assess the screen pass rate. And um, to not, not to go overly into detail, you can see that again, it is close to a linear function with 0% screen pass as soon as the LVESD by CT was below 35 millimeters and reached a screen pass rate of above 60 millimeters. Now, of course, you have to keep in mind that this disregards the functional status of the patient. Which is and, and this does not mean that every patient with an LVESD above 60 is eligible. This is just a CT-based analysis. So I'd like to conclude for the second part that LVESD seems to be a significant predictor of anatomical suitability, uh, probably because it is a surrogate for neo-LVOT. It is uh, something that can be easily assessed before entering into time-consuming measurements or um, um, calculating valve specific models. And it seems to be a simple and straightforward assessment within the TMBI screening. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And I'd like to mention that, of course, I'm presenting on behalf of the study group, including Nicola and Ellison and others. Thank you. So thank you very much, Leonard, for, uh, for a presentation about the, the CT screening that, uh, as you mentioned, is crucial. And for uh, this uh, effort uh, to try to simplify the, the CT screening. I hope we'll, we'll have time to discuss that. Uh, I think it, it is now time for you to also share with us uh, the commercial experience uh, you had with uh, two cases some uh, weeks ago uh, with uh, this standard device. Okay, thanks again, Nicola. So it's my pleasure now to, towards the end of this session, to um, show you 
uh, two case examples. These were the first commercial cases that we did uh, to, at, uh, in April uh, of this year in Hamburg. So again, my disclosures. So I'll go right into the cases in order not to lose any time. This is the first case um, um, and with his baseline characteristics. While you can see uh, the baseline echo running towards the right, this was an elderly 70, 70 year old male patient. He had a status post myocardial revascularization plus biological aortic valve replacement uh, two years ago. He had uh, chronic atrial fibrillation. He had a somewhat reduced LVEF uh, of around 35%. He was severely symptomatic. And um, as you can maybe already appreciate from the echo, and I can show you more 3D assessment later, this is in functional mitral regurgitation according to the surgical type uh, classification of Carpentier's uh, 3B. And you can see the risk scores towards the bottom of the screen, which is obviously uh, a patient with elevated risk. This is the 3D echo study for this particular patient I, in the 3D en face. I, excuse, I, excuse me for the uh, ventilation artifact on the, on the left, but still I, can, I think you can see the restriction of the posterior leaflet, especially in the P3 segment with a broad uh, regurgitant jet towards the right. And this is the second case, um, elderly lady, 84 years old. She also had a, a aortic valve replacement and this time it was via a TAVA procedure. Uh, the year before. You can see the echo towards the right. This is a very different appearance. This is a severely eccentric jet uh, across or above the uh, posterior leaflet. Uh, this time it's not because of a restriction, but an anterior leaflet prolapse due to um, a flail. I can show you a little later on. Also, she was severely symptomatic and you can see the risk scores below. Again, a patient who would be suboptimal for um, a surgical approach. This is the 3D echo study for this particular patient. I, can, I think you can see the flail in the above uh, uh, loop for, uh, near, the, um, near the A1 segment of the valve. In general, I would say this is a morphologically severely affected valve, something that probably is not only, uh, that is uh, suboptimal for an edge to edge uh, mitral valve repair as she is clinically for an open valve procedure, a surgical. So I think she's a good pick for a transcatheter valve replacement using 10.9. CT, CT screening, I'm just going to go through case one because it's somewhat uh, repetitive. Um, you are familiar with some of these images from the base, from the introductory uh, presentation uh, from a few minutes ago. This is this patient's CT with um, end systolic uh, as well as end diastolic assessment of the annulus. And again, not to bore you with detail, the far right column shows you the percentage oversize uh, with respect to the parameter. So in end systole, um, the, this would be a 14% oversize. In um, end diastole, it would be uh, close to 16% oversize. And this when uh, using a 39M standard profile, 109 THV. And again, as, as uh, earlier, uh, we are screening for new LVOT, both systole, diastole. You can see the values below the, in this particular case, the new LVOT was uh, around 300 square millimeters, 337 in systole and 294 in diastole. So ample uh, space uh, regarding this parameter. The uh, projected or the proposed working angle, fluoroscopic working angles. It's a steep RAO of 45 degrees, which is a little difficult to obtain, a little unpractical rather. So to the right, a uh, working angle of LAO 9, cranial 13 was what we chose for this particular case. And so within the procedure, first of all, of course, is gaining thoracic and then apical access. Um, I typically insert a long six or seven French sheath and with a, a standard coronary uh, soft, soft tip J wire, retrograde retrogradely past the mitral valve, making sure that there's no entanglement in the sub apparatus. You can use a, a pullback maneuver with a PA balloon if you like, but sometimes if you leave in, leave in uh, the longish uh, sheath that may also uh, help you in determining if whether you're uh, entangled or not. And the next uh, step would be to insert the, uh, the uh, uh, tendine sheath. This is shown in the, or has been done, as you can see from the left fluoroscopic image, the valve is already advancing from uh, five, five o'clock maybe in the image in the 
sheath, you can also see the fluoroscopic markers of the biological arctic valve prosthesis um, in place. You can see the uh, uh, sternal wires, and you may also be able to see two pictet catheters, one in the arctic root, one in the left ventricle, uh, which are, at least in our hands, uh, connected to a pressure reader at all times for online uh, trans LVOT uh, gradient estimation. So if there is something that worries you, you could uh, react early before hemodynamic deterioration of the patient. Towards the right, uh, it's just a few clicks more and the valve stent is beginning to exit the sheath. And typically at that time point, we switch to uh, uh, the echo again. And this is, um, in the, this is always a uh, BICOM view um, in both of these images. Uh, and you can see that the valve stent, the inflow of the tendine valve stent is already uh, somewhat de uh, uh, developed. Um, it's important to uh, centralize the valve before seating. The seating, you can, I think you can see towards the right of the picture, the V-shape of the tendine um, being opposed onto the atrial aspect of the, of the mitral annulus. And in this image, in this slide, you can see to in the left uh, panel, you can see the tendine in place. The radiopaque structure towards the right lower uh, corner of the fluoroscopic image is actually the tether fixation tool, um, which we're using to determine the tether tension for valve fixation. And in the right is a final, um, um, the final view, a 3D surgeon's en face view of the tendine in place at 12 o'clock, you almost you're almost able to do, to uh, discriminate the arctic valve and the D shape of the outer stent frame is nicely visible. And so these two cases, uh, which we did in uh, the end of April this year, just to give you the final follow up device times were 33 and 19 minutes. This is uh, defined as sheath inversion insertion and final tensioning of the tether. Uh, we achieved technical and device success in both of these cases, according to the MVARC um, criteria. Discharge was day six in case one and day, uh, this, and day 13, case two. Uh, in the second case, this was due to some, some mild degree of renal failure in this chronic renal failure patient, whereas the other patient experienced no adverse events. So I'd like to conclude that um, these were actually the first two commercial tendine cases that we're able to do outside trial protocol related restrictions. More specifically with these two patients, actually the status post AVR in the first and status post TAV in the second would actually have been an exclusion criterion from the trial. I think the cases demonstrate the tendine versatility that Nicola has introduced to you early on in two extremely different patients. If you think about uh, the etiology, FMR versus DMR, uh, the fact that the first patient had um, uh, um, moderately impaired left ventricular function, whereas left ventricular function was preserved in the second case. And we were also using the largest versus the smallest valve. And I think uh, the uncomplicated procedural and post-procedural course of those patients nicely demonstrates uh, what can be done with tendine in extremely different cases. And with that, I would like to conclude and thank you for your attention. So thank you very much. Uh, we're going now to uh, summarize uh, what we've learned during this session. So we've learned uh, through the data, we've, uh, we've seen that uh, this tendine TMVI device is able to provide a complete and sustained up to two years uh, and, and uh, even five years for a small number of patients treated by Addison's team, uh, a sustained elimination of MR. Uh, despite being able to address a wide range of anatomies, patients suffering from complex degenerative MR, from a large regurgitant functional MR, and we've seen also patients suffering from MAC, that is a subset of patients giving a promising results. Uh, I think it's important to focus on the fact that it's a safe procedure, uh, despite being performed for transapical access, and I would also add it's a safe and from a technical point of view for the operator, it's an easy procedure. I think all of the operators who have done this procedure haven't felt a very hard learning curve and it's easy to follow the advices that are, are, that are given to you to obtain uh, from the first patient a perfect outcome. Uh, it's important to understand, and you've underlined that, that there is a clear and uh, a very precise imaging selection process through ECHO and cardiac CT that is necessary to identify suitable candidates. 
And uh, finally, I think we have to remind that now this device is CMR and commercially available and that uh, it expands the heart team options for the treatment of uh, high surgical risk patients uh, suffering from severe symptomatic MR. So I want to thank you, Alison, for uh, having uh, uh, um, run this session with me. Uh, Leonard, also, thank you very much for, uh, for your participation and uh, inputs. We have to thank Abbott Company for having uh, uh, organized this, uh, this symposium. And of course, thank you to all of uh, you who have made the effort to connect to this uh, EPCR session. Thank you very much and goodbye.